Hi class, welcome to chapter 22. Um, we're, today we're going to be looking at American foreign policy. Uh, we will be expanding on some of the uh, principles that we've uh, been discussing so far uh, via American expansion, uh, you know, the uh, nation <clears throat> slowly but surely growing um, and now soon to be incorporating more and more territories into its fold uh, from one means or another. And, uh, you know, this is truly kind of at the turn of the century going to lead the United States into a very advantageous position uh, because pretty soon we are going to be looking at World War One, and then soon and shortly after World War Two. Uh, and so <clears throat> at the turn of the century, all of this, uh, you know, is going to essentially be the foundational building blocks towards uh, United States, you know, hegemonic power and supremacy in the 20th uh, century, um, all of the 1900s. Uh, after World War II, uh, the United States pretty much is going to go on a uh, an enormous sort of power binge. Uh, but how did things lead up to it? And so we're going to be looking at that today. And so some things for us to consider as we're going through the lecture today. Uh, we're going to be discussing American expansion versus isolationism. Um, what was isolationism? And what was the debate between uh, the expansionists and the isolationists. And so we're going to try to kind of have a nice discussion about that, uh, see how it all came to be, how it formulated, and obviously who ended up, you know, kind of winning, uh, you know, winning out at the end. Uh, American foreign relations. We're going to see that, uh, <clears throat> you know, how the United States was uh, interacting with the rest of the world. What was their position globally? How did everyone view them? Uh, and what kind of interests did they uh, pursue? And finally, we're going to have a discussion of soft power versus hard power. I don't know if any of you have ever um, heard of those terms, but we're, uh, we are going to look at uh, Taft's uh, quote-unquote dollar diplomacy uh, and then compare that to Roosevelt's big stick policy. Uh, and so we will kind of define soft power and hard power, uh, define dollar diplomacy, big stick policy, what the differentiation was, and uh, wrap it all up with a discussion of, you know, how the United States potentially today, making comparisons, uh, which form of power does the U.S. currently employ? One, one of them, both of them, right? We'll see. So to start off with, um, if any of you want a quick kind of like recap, right, in like a 14, 15 minute segment, this is our resident favorite, John Green, um, you know, doing American imperialism, a crash course. So this can kind of be a nice uh, recap for you if you have the time to uh, watch. But let's jump into isolationism and expansionism. So at this point in time, uh, we have already discussed westward expansion. We've ex uh, discussed the United States uh, pushing westward, gaining additional territory, Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican Secession, uh, the U.S. is growing astronomically. And at this point in time, the United States is truly kind of getting closer and closer towards uh, attaining a respectable position in the world. Uh, let us not forget, in the 1800s, Europe and all those European nations were still the superpowers of the world. Uh, they are the ones that held enormous empires. Uh, they are the ones that had a global reach of trade and military. And so the United States was, uh, you know, more or less a blip on the radar. But the 1800s and westward expansion and all of the industrialization and urbanization that was occurring in the 1800s, it really converted the U.S. into kind of growing and blossoming into this larger force, a force that needed to be reckoned with by the European powers. And so... As this was going on, there was an internal debate within America between the isolationists and expansionists. Now, the isolationists were people favoring, obviously, being isolated, um, advocating for uh, not becoming active in foreign affairs, right? Not getting into different alliances or wars abroad. Essentially, focus inward, focus on your own home and territory, and you will prosper. Um, and there is some... <clears throat> long-standing reach, right, and kind of roots towards isolationism, because uh, going even as far back as George Washington, 
in George Washington's farewell address, right, him being the first president of the United States. Uh, in his farewell address, he actually stated and recommended for the United States and future presidents not to get involved in uh, foreign wars uh, and kind of all these interventions. Um, and so his reasoning was essentially stick uh, to uh, domestic policy, uh, focus on yourself and your own nation, and you will prosper uh, instead of, let's say, being dragged into foreign wars and all of this intervention. Uh, and on the opposite, uh, opposite side of this it are the expansionists, right? Or modernly, I suppose, right? Their nicknames are the Warhawks. Uh, and so the expansionists, you know, from the crux word expansion, right? They want to see the United States grow. This is truly the manifest destiny mentality, uh, you know, hyped up even more. And so the manifest destiny, uh, you know, followers or believers want to see the American empire expand uh, as far as it can go. And, you know, to a certain degree, you can't really blame them. Uh, because, you know, living in the United States during the 1800s was kind of the pinnacle of, you know, let's say their expansion, right? Things were literally progressing in a uh, exponential uh, route, right, for their benefit. Uh, you can compare that to, let's say, if you lived within, I don't know, ancient Rome during the expansion of the Roman uh, Republic and Empire, right? All of this wealth and prosperity. Or if you lived in the, um, if you lived in France during, during Louis XIV's reign, right? Uh, you know, all of these kind of different periods of time that for one reason or another, wealth, uh, expansion, military prowess, all of these different things kind of formulate to grow this nation or empire or whatnot. And so many were advocating for, you know, expanding territorially, expanding economically. Uh, and, you know, for them to see just how far this American project can go. And one of the largest, uh, you know, signifiers of this, perhaps the largest, uh, towards the second half of the 1800s was the Alaska Purchase. So the last time the United States had purchased a significant chunk of land was the Louisiana Purchase. We bought it from Napoleon. Uh, from the French, because Napoleon needed some extra money to finance his wars in Europe. And literally right after the Civil War, uh, we ended up buying all of Alaska from the Russian Empire, from the Tsars on the Siberian steppe. And, you know, they approached the United States <clears throat> and it was signed by President Andrew Johnson. Uh, and so he purchased Alaska for $7.2 million, which essentially is pennies, right? It is just cheap for all of that land, including especially afterwards, once we found out that it had large amounts of oil, gold, mineral wealth, uh, forests, right? Uh, it was, you know, truly this enormous uh, literal gold mine. And it doubled the size of the United States, right? Without shedding a single drop of blood. So, it's a win-win. Uh, the proposition was negotiated by Secretary of State William Seward. Now, Seward initially negotiated this deal, which was like a phenomenal deal, right? As far as foreign diplomacy goes, if you were a diplomat, this is like a slam dunk, right? So you would imagine you would come home and everybody would, you know, sing your praises, right? Throw roses and, you know, parades at you. Um, but Seward, uh, for whatever reason, um, began to get hazed by the American people. And so the nickname Seward's Folly began. And so it was a derogatory uh, tone and nickname that he developed uh, because of this purchase. And so many isolationists were uh, saying, listen, you know, we expanded way too quickly. How can we possibly... I mean, literally, just double the size of the United States. This is ridiculous. And so it was called Seward's Folly because many of them believed that this purchase would not work. They believed that this entire territory was a mistake to purchase because it was just too soon. Um, so similar to how, uh, I don't know, if you're at the gym and you suddenly put on 500 pounds to lift, way beyond your means, right? You're in over your head. 
um, or you just take way too much work, um, let's say, at your job, right, and kind of get overwhelmed. So many folks were thinking that the United States of America was overwhelming itself too fast, too quickly to expand. But overall, I would say that Seward had the last laugh, clearly, because eventually Alaska became uh, uh, one of our states and was fully incorporated in the United States uh, system. And so the main point of all of this is that Seward carefully started to add on to and build the American empire through diplomacy and with a key aspect, not getting involved in military engagements to do so. And so this is an example, an early onset example of soft power. Soft power is essentially using diplomacy and coercion to your advantage without any military means. And so you are spending money, you are making negotiations and agreements and treaties, right? You're using diplomacy for the betterment of your people versus hard power. It is the usage of military force, right? Uh, and so to exert whatever, you know, policy it is that you want. Uh, and so uh, we will get a little bit into it more with our uh, discussions of Teddy Roosevelt's uh, big stick policy and Taft's dollar diplomacy. But this is like an early onset uh, version of soft power. And we have two wonderful videos here kind of detailing, uh, you know, in a couple minutes each, the Russians selling uh, the Americans uh, the territory of Alaska. And as you can just see from the preview clip on the left hand side, uh, just gorgeous mountainscapes, right? Beautiful rivers, just so much natural uh, resources available to the United States. Uh, it is truly, you know, one of the best purchasing decisions of land in history. And so here is uh, Mr. Uh, Seward uh, sitting over here, uh, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, kind of advocate for his, uh, you know, entire purchase. Right. And so over here, uh, you know, we have the two flags represented uh, on the uh, upper uh, right hand side. We have the American flag and we have the Russian uh, imperial symbol over here. And so all of this kind of imagery, right, of diplomacy, right, of uh, you know, using these non-military means to accomplish your goals. And so Seward, uh, you know, was published in multiple magazines uh, and editorials such as the Harper's Weekly and others. Uh, and so some were obviously singing his praise, uh, you know, the expansionists, uh, which were very vocal uh, and probably I would say the majority voice at the time, they were extremely vocal and, you know, supportive of his decisions, right? They were seeing him as a hero. Uh, and so the isolationists, on the other hand, were obviously calling or nicknaming him, right? Kind of Seward's folly. But he did, you know, do for the United States a great service, right? Because he literally doubled the size of the United States and incorporated Alaska into our nation. And so one of his famous quotes was, all prosperous nations must expand. And so that fundamental, uh, you know, viewpoint and theory that to expand is, you know, the kind of central mantra of all of these nations during this day and age, uh, you have to expand or you will die, essentially. And so it is a kind of uh, ancient historic uh, kind of understanding of the world, but one that, you know, holds true. Um, any power in history that has, <clears throat> let's say, uh, began to expand and conquer militarily, right, and, you know, uh, incorporate other uh, groups into their kind of lexicon of power. Uh, it's kind of like a snowball, right? And that snowball effect, as the snowball goes down the mountain, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's more unstoppable. Uh, the momentum is there. And so he wanted to build on this momentum, and others wanted to build on this momentum as well. And so here's a map kind of representing Alaska. Um, and, you know, Alaska in, uh, next to uh, the eastern side of Russia uh, and obviously Canada over there in the green. And so the territory was, uh, you know, seceded by Russia to the United States and it was annexed. Uh, it would take a number of years up until the mid 1900s for Alaska to eventually become a state. Um, however, this territory 
was uh, you know seen as a great uh, purchase and even later on especially during the Cold War as we're going to see in the future uh, is going to serve as a very nice strategic location for the United States and then hilariously enough if anybody remembers uh, from a number of years ago right uh, does anybody remember Sarah Palin she had her little moment in uh, like politics when she was running for vice president alongside of the Republican ticket uh, and so she kept, you know, famously saying that she could stand on the tip of Alaska, right, and then see Putin on the other side. Um, you know, I miss, I miss those, uh, those days. Uh, fun politics. <laughs> uh, in conjunction with that expansionist model, right, that expansionist train of thought, uh, we started to see that. Uh, we, our religious leaders and our progressive reformers wanted also to spread the, uh, the wealth, to spread the kind of gospel of America, right? An American hegemony. And so we start to see that Christian influences uh, or Christian forces wanted to influence abroad. And so we start to see many missionary societies form after the Civil War. And, uh, you know, with the main intent of going abroad to convert to recruit more people into the christian faith uh similar to how i'm not sure if any of you uh let's say have maybe uh mormon friends uh, but you know within the mormon faith modeling in the u.s one of the like early tenets is that you have to go on a mission right so they'll go off for two three four years into a foreign country right and kind of try to do good for the world, try to convert and, you know, help them see the light of God. And so this is seen as a moral and spiritual uh, expansion of the American ethos as well. Uh, and so the majority of these individuals were women missionaries, right? They were female. And, you know, they spent much of their time abroad advocating for this Americanized vision of a modern civilization in conjunction with teaching the Bible. So on the one hand, they're using their biblical knowledge, right, in order to advocate, you know, obviously uh, converting over to Christianity. But on the other hand, they are also advocating for American supremacy, the American way of capitalism, the, um, the American way of, let's say, uh, growing technologically uh, and socially. And so they're trying to spread their cultural, their cultural and religious beliefs uh, onto the rest of the world. And this is, you know, kind of a byproduct of social Darwinism. I believe we talked about this before, but uh, it does reign true during this time. And I'll kind of go over it again now. So social Darwinism is, or was, I should say, uh, the the manipulation and bastardization of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And so many social uh, critics took that beautiful piece of uh, scientific literature and theories that he was proposing after he went to Madagascar and studied the Galapagos uh, Islands and the Finches and created his you know, theory of evolution, which is a fundamental building block of modern uh, biology and science. Uh, and so many were taking that and you know, converting it into sociology and politics, essentially saying that uh, those who evolved in a better way are now, let's say, part of the more civilized, uh, you know, nations of the world. Those who did not evolve properly or as well are now in the more poor and non-Christianized uh, members of the world and societies. And so they use this as an explanation for bringing the Christian faith and civilization to the people around the world. And so as American uh, missionaries are going towards uh, Cuba, the Philippines, uh, Hawaii, right? All of these other locations, Samoa, Guam, they are bringing with them this understanding of look at our growing nation and our military and our economy uh, and our industry. Uh, obviously, God has deemed us right? The chosen people. We are benefiting from all of this. And so, you know, we as Christians need to impart this knowledge and faith onto you as well, right? So it was seen as this moralistic viewpoint of saving uh, all of these other folks. 
And we have a wonderful primary source here by a Miss Lottie Moon during one of our missions uh, towards China and the East. Uh, and so I highlighted some of or uh, underlined some of the more important bits, but uh, let us read through uh, some of them. Uh, we had the best possible voyage over the, over the water. Good weather, no headwinds, scarcely any rolling or pitching. In short, all that reasonable people could ask. I spent a week here last fall and, of course, feel very natural to be here again. I do so love the East and Eastern life. Japan fascinated my heart and fancy four years ago. But now I honestly believe I love China the best and actually, which is stranger still, like the Chinese best. So uh, Miss Lottie Moon uh, stayed in China through various uh, famines and turmoils that they were having for decades. Uh, she stayed through the Boxer Rebellion, this famous kind of uprising by uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, martial artists and other uh, you know, peasants revolts. Uh, against the establishment and a bunch of other hardships and she uh, you know wanted as other folks right her primary goal was to uh, Christianize the people of China to bring more folks into the faith uh, and so she saw it as her personal responsibility to convert all of these individuals and she personally ended up converting hundreds of Chinese over to Christianity and so uh, but here we see kind of this nice acculturation right so from the quote here you know, we, we're not seeing that, uh, you know, she's saying, oh, these heathens, right? These godless creatures that I had to uh, bring from the dirt up into civilization, right? She's not kind of saying anything as, you know, egregious as that. Uh, she's actually saying they, you know, they want over her heart. She loves these areas and the people. Um, so, you know, some of that early expansionist mantra and social Darwinistic theories um, you know, as we see here, didn't, did not really hold up, right, in theory and practice. And so as soon as they actually got there and were able to, you know, see the, these nations for themselves and interact with the people on the grounds, uh, that's those social Darwinistic theories started to crumble a bit. Uh, and so that, you know, is, you know, at least a silver lining here. <clears throat> Foreign expansion and the theoretical prowess of such. So, numerous amounts of businesses and missionaries and reformers during this day and age were uh, growing into the expansionist model, right, as we were saying. Um, and, you know, the previous decades before the turn of the century, before the 1890s, moving on to 1900, uh, saw presidents that did not really have enough uh, popular support or congressional support for them to kind of go into, you know, kind of uh, international, you know, expeditions, if you will. And naturally so, because in 1865, the Civil War had just ended. We lost 600,000 uh, Americans in the bloody fighting. And the presidents after that were pretty much just completely wrapped up in Reconstruction, trying to heal the nation again. And so kind of conquering or, you know, annexing foreign territories was kind of the last thing on people's minds, which is why when Seward came back with the Alaska Purchase, people were thinking, like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> this is not the time for us to be expanding. Um, but here uh, it is prudent to look at Frederick Jackson Turner. He was an American historian in the early 20th century and wrote his most famous piece, uh, frontier thesis and so this was the idea of his that uh, the European traditions uh, that were encountering all of this native wilderness uh, it was complete completely central for the development of American democracy and our Judeo-Christian individual spirit and our innovative character so essentially uh, saying that, you know, the blend of our historical past with Europe and our descendancy from uh, England, uh, you know, our Eurocentric view of the world, uh, and this meeting of the wilderness, the wild, untouched land, all of this, not untouched, because obviously others were living there, but in their minds, right, untouched land, uh, it was, you know, the perfect sort of recipe, right, for, you know, kind of embarking on the frontier. 
And so let's look at some of his quotes to see, you know, what he was talking about. For nearly three centuries, the dominant fact in American life has been expansion. Pretty true. America has been expanding gradually. American energy will continually demand a wider field for its exercise. Also true. Americans were getting more and more hungry for larger uh, acquisitions, larger adventures, right? And the expansionists were going gun ho The demands for a vigorous foreign policy, for an inter-oceanic canal, for a revival of our power upon the seas, and for the extension of American influence to outlying islands and adjoining countries are indications that the forces of expansion will continue. Uh, essentially saying that we need a vigorous foreign policy to satiate the American spirit, to satiate uh, the American uh, endeavors toward expansion and uh, naval supremacy. So he's seeing the writing on the wall that the United States is growing and to meet the demand of our growing uh, you know, reality, right? We need a foreign policy that can match. And so Frederick Jackson Turner's uh, collection of essays and his theses uh, ended up being read wildly in the 1890s. And as we we're going to see, influenced others such as Theodore Roosevelt later on. Here's another wonderful quote by Mr. Turner. American social development has been continually beginning over again on the frontier. This perennial rebirth, this fluidity of American life, this expansion westward with its new opportunities, its continuous touch with the simplicity of primitive society, furnish the forces dominating American character. The true point of view in the history of the nation is not the Atlantic coast, it is the Great West. And so this is a poignant point he is trying to make uh, that the West, right, the kind of mythical West of westward expansion, that is where the American, uh, you know, future is held. And so we traditionally have been just pushing West, right, from the colonial days all the way up to the turn of the century here. And so we are going to see that as, uh, <clears throat> you know, as the, as the years are progressing, that the West is where the United States inevitably is going to expand the most. Uh, we got the, Atlanta, uh, the Alaska Purchase, and we're going to be seeing towards uh, the next few slides also uh, how Hawaii was also annexed and incorporated into the American, uh, you know, democratic system. And so, you know, he does have a point here. The United States had a history of expanding westward, and that was at the very heart of it where their future was going to lay. And so here is a wonderful um, political cartoon of Uncle Sam. And notice how he is <clears throat> in his arms, right? Carrying all of these different things. Machinery, uh, education and religion, bridges, steel rails, right? So he's bringing with him economy, industry, technology, um, education, religion, all of these things that the West and America has heralded as, right? Uh, God blessing them with the right ingredients, right, for expansion and uh, kind of might. And here Uncle Sam is stepping over the Philippines, which is just seen as a stepping stone, uh, towards China. And China is the name of the game here. And so if you notice, and let me get my uh, pointer here, but if you notice here on the right-hand side, well, first of all, we have the stereotypical Chinaman, right? Uh, and over here, all of these wanted signs, wanted 100,000 bridges, 500,000 engines, 2 million cars, right? And it just keeps going and going. And so for the United States, their uh, annexation of the Philippines from the Spanish-American War um, that we saw previously, uh, in which Theodore Roosevelt made a name for himself, right, with the Rough Riders um, and his victory at San Juan Hill. Once they got the incorporation of the Philippines, right, or of, uh, under American control and influence, uh, they saw that merely as a stepping stone towards China, which was seen as this large market, right, uh, this money source for them. Uh, ironically enough, 
more than a century later, uh, the tables would be turned. So in this scenario, the United States was the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. And here trying to sell all of these goods to these Asian countries. And somehow in a little over 100 years, we have completely turned that up on its head. And so now the uh, China and the other uh, Southeast Asian countries are the manufacturers of the world. And the United States is now the consumer society. Very interesting how that dynamic um, you know, took place. But we will be seeing that uh, slow transformation and evolution in the next few lectures as we're going to be getting into the Cold War, the 1950s, 60s, rise of consumerism, etc. And here, I love this political cartoon because uh, Uncle Sam is always such a malleable character. And so here he is getting fitted for a suit. And, you know, what uh, cloth is, you know, making up his uh, outfit uh, and being enlightened, right? Good foreign policy, rational expansion. And of course, uh, Uncle Sam looks like, uh, you know, he's been living well uh, because, right, you know, the larger the imagery is, you know, it in indicates, right, gluttony. It indicates that the United States is gobbling up more and more territories. And if you kind of tilt your head to the side, uh, the various stripes here on his pants say Texas, Louisiana Purchase, Alaska, Florida, California, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. So all of these territories that the U.S. was incorporating in its uh, power structure, right, was kind of uh, allowing for the U.S. to grow and for, therefore, Uncle Sam to, uh, you know, look as amazing and living his best life over here. <clears throat> ah, the power of the sea. So a main uh, early development that happened at the turn of the century here, right, in the 1890s, uh, which will pay dividends in World War One and Two, is that <clears throat> the United States military started to see that they needed to harness the power of the sea. They needed to grow their navy, not necessarily just only their land forces, but also their naval supremacy. Because if you look throughout history, some of the greatest empires in history and the nations in the world, uh, they had enormous, grandiose, great navies, right, to, uh, you know, expand their uh, influence around the world. And so here we have Alfred Thayer Mahan. Uh, he was an officer and a historian. And so he was studying the past. He was studying the correlations between these great powers and their naval capabilities. And so he saw the Navy as an instrumental aspect for the United States to move forward with their foreign expansion, uh, you know, endeavors. And so he suggested three strategies to assist in this. Number one, that the Navy needed rebuilding because our Navy was out of repair and a bit old and outdated. Number two, establish a set of naval bases to fuel the fleets. So essentially, um, instead of, let's say, you have the United States and wherever the heck they want to go, um, instead of making one long trip and back, it's not that effective. Uh, you want to have the United States and multiple naval bases around the world. So that allows you more ports of access to refuel, uh, uh, get more supplies in, but at the same time, just strategically, right? It's better strategically for you to expand how many areas of influence you have. And number three, building a canal across the Isthmus of Central America in Panama to decrease two thirds the time and power to move the Navy from the Pacific to the Atlantic. So the U.S. was in a very weird, strange location because it's, you know, it's sandwiched between Canada and Mexico. And so two of its sides are on two completely different oceans. And so if you think about, about it from that aspect, if the Western or Eastern fleet wanted to help one another, they, they would have to travel all the way down South America and go back up. It took a long time. And so he recommended across uh, Central America, which eventually would become the Panama Canal, uh, make a man-made canal so that ships could just travel that much faster. And so uh, due to his influence, right, um, and his work, 
the Naval Act of 1890 was enacted, which gave uh, uh, a substantial amount of funding uh, for new cruisers, torpedo boats, um, and ships. And so within eight years, the U.S. had built up a fleet of 160 vessels, 114 of which were newly built of steel. Uh, and so within just a few years' time, right, they had built up this, you know, strong fleet uh, and was now the third strongest navy in the world. So imagine, just just imagine those numbers for a second. Because it is quite staggering. For a couple hundred years, Spain, Portugal, and Great Britain, right? They were having these large fleets, this large naval supremacy across the world. And, you know, the United States over all of this period of time, right? From the American Revolution all the way up to the Civil War, etc., was having just, they had a navy, but it was just there. And then within eight years or so, right? Maybe, a, let's say, just we'll round it off to a decade, 10 years of really putting their minds to it. They built up the Navy to be the third strongest in the world, right? That, that's mind-boggling, right? But that's just a testament to just how much industrial might that the U.S. had at its disposal, right, at this point in time. And this political cartoon, which I love, shows Lady Liberty. Uh, and she is getting glamoured up, right, in the powder room. Uh, and her headdress is... Uh, a ship, right, called World Power. And so here, um, it is kind of uh, showing that naval supremacy is going to be, let's say, the creme de la creme, right, of her outfit, or the most important part of Lady Liberty, right, and her kind of policies uh, going forward. Uh, Hawaii. So, um, we have here Hawaii's last queen. Well, actually, do I have the additional video? Yes, I do. Um, and so, for anyone who has ever been to Hawaii, it is a beautiful island. It is a beautiful place. I, I visited there when I was, uh, like, what, 14, 15 years old? It was many years ago with my, uh, with my parents. And it was, we went to the island of Oahu, a great uh, and comfortable stay. Uh, and we actually visited a bunch of the ships in uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, which was pretty cool, walking through, right, all the corridors. Um, but it's an interesting place because it is, you know, an American state and everything's Americanized. But at the same time, the island has its own kind of culture and traditions, you know, uh, that's not precisely American. And so it's like this blending of two different peoples. And so that was my first kind of like hands on experience with uh with hawaii and then over the years right with my studies right i've kind of been growing my understanding of the interactions with the u.s and hawaii uh and it's a pretty fascinating story so uh hawaii at this time in the eight up until the 1800s the late 1800s uh was an independent kingdom they had their monarchs their kings and queens right and they ruled and so it was a uh, it was a typical monarchy where their right to rule was delineated from a divine uh, power, right? So that the gods, in whatever form they were worshipping, was giving these families, right, this one family, uh, the right to rule the Hawaiian people and communicate between the people and, let's say, the higher powers. And since America was growing and expanding, they started to see that the uh, Hawaiians had this beautiful... Uh, islands, right? These, uh, you know, wonderful agricultural soil uh, to start making sugar, uh, to start uh, growing uh, pineapples, right? On all these delicious delicacies that we needed and that the market of the world wanted to pay for. And so over the years, American companies and businesses had started to uh, invest in these plantations, right? Uh, and to you know, start to harvest and make money off of all of these, uh, you know, uh, beautiful natural resources of Hawaii. However, over time, it became uh, less and less f uh, fruitful for these corporations and these companies to share power with the kingdom. They wanted more. And so 
they came up with a very insidious plot to essentially throw a military coup and dethrone the last queen of Hawaii. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Lilo, uh, Lilo Kalani uh, or Queen Lily, I guess for short. But they performed a military coup. And so they tapped into uh, some kind of local business resentment towards the monarchy. And they staged an armed revolt. And they funded the armed revolt as well. And so Hawaii eventually saw their monarchy stripped. Uh, they saw their people uh, incorporated and annexed into the United States against their will. But, you know, there's not much that the Hawaiian people could have done because they were a smaller island and a smaller monarchy. And the United States at that time was this large megalith of a rising power with a strong military, with uh, this now new powerful navy. And so they saw the writing on the wall. And as soon as the uh, you know American businessmen and companies established the, the coup, uh, there was not much left for them to do. And so in 1898, uh, the Hawaiian monarchy was uh, no, finally no more. And the queen, uh, the last queen of Hawaii, Queen Lily, uh, she ended up uh, being under house arrest for the rest of her life uh, in Hawaii in her palace. Uh, and previous to this, right, the decades that she was in rule, uh, she went and she she hosted, um, you know, monarchs from all around the world. She was she went to the White House. American presidents came to her island of Hawaii as well. Uh, so they were definitely involved in foreign uh, diplomacy and interaction and trade. But this is seen as kind of like the last uh, one of the last kind of greatest a uh, annexations, right, and acquisitions of territory by the US right during this time. And so if you have uh, you know a little bit of free time on your hands, this is not too terribly long. It's around I think 12 minutes or something like that. Uh, this details the last uh, few moments and years uh, and months leading up to uh, the coup d'etat, right? The dethroning of Hawaii's last queen and from some of the local residents what that meant for the Hawaiian people what it meant to finally see their beloved queen who they had worshipped right and followed uh essentially be put to the side and they are now forcefully going to become american citizens right and whatever that was going to mean and so here's uh, queen lily on the left hand side <clears throat> uh during uh the early years of her reign and in her prime uh in her heyday over on the right hand side uh, closer towards the coup d'etat that was uh, going to unfold. Um, and so over time, uh, she was allowed to remain at her uh, at her palace in Hawaii. Uh, and so still had foreign dignitaries. She still had uh, her, uh, you know, her uh, uh, staff, right, looking after her. So at least they allowed for her to retain a lot of her, uh, you know, status kind of moving forward. But uh, she was definitely the last uh, monarch of the Hawaiian people. <clears throat> oh, yellow journalism. You know, it is not journalism that is necessarily yellow, uh, but although it did start off, uh, you know, with some yellow cartoons. Uh, yellow journalism at the time is seen throughout all of the journals and newspaper editorials uh, in that very similar to our own modern day newsreels and cycles. Uh, they wanted to have eye-catching headlines to increase sales. So you know how every single time you turn on the news today, whether it be Fox News, CNN, uh, Vice, whatever, it's not what it used to be. It's not some guy or you know, or, or lady just sitting there, let's say with their glasses down and just with a very monotone voice saying, and the United States and Russia have just entered into a um, peaceful uh, contractual agreement, right? It's not that, right? That's going to be boring. You're going to fall asleep in two minutes. Uh, versus, right, you turn on one of the news stations, breaking news, Russia going to war with U.S., question mark, exclamation point, and you're just thinking to yourself, oh, dear God, I have to watch this right now. And so this kind of sensationalized news started here with yellow journalism, and we still see it today 
even on a greater scale. And so they started to exaggerate the news. They started to uh, throw in scandals into the news uh, and sensationalize it. It was initially uh, nicknamed yellow journalism because some of their early cartoons in, uh, you know, in the newspapers were, were you know, uh, of a yellow tint and variety. Um, and then the name just kind of stuck with them um, as they started to kind of form this, uh, you know, style of writing. And so some big notable two players of the game of the newspaper industries were William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. These two names should uh, perhaps ring a bell. The second one, Pulitzer, is perhaps the more famous one uh, because later he donated much of his fortune to fund the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and so arguably he has the longest reigned uh, kind of uh, effect of his name, right, throughout the historical reverberations of time. Uh, Hearst, if anyone has ever visited Hearst Castle in California, it's a couple hours drive uh, from Los Angeles. It is a beautiful kind of Greco-Roman uh, style, essentially a palace that he built for himself because the newspapers of the day and age, they were the main form of communication. And so if you were a, essentially the head of the company of a large newspaper company, uh, you were sitting pretty on huge finances, right? And huge profits. But, um, on the right hand side here, we have a National Geographic documentary series, Hearst versus Pulitzer. It's a bit on the longer side if you have time. Um, if you have 40 plus minutes, uh, you can view it. And so it does a nice job of detailing yellow journalism at the time and what kind of scandals that they kind of involved themselves in. If any of you have access to Amazon Prime, um, please watch this uh, you know, mini series. You don't have to watch all of it, but in this one episode of American Titans, season one, episode five, uh, it details Hearst versus Pulitzer. And so the moments that are most kind of consequential to our class and our discussion of yellow journalism would be from the beginning to around the 15 minute mark and then the 35 minute mark till the end. Uh, and so it just shows you what yellow journalism was and how it possibly came to be. And so between these two newspapers, uh, they started to, you know, uh, kind of sway the American public in whatever way, shape or form they wanted to, to make additional sales, even sometimes going as far as uh, stirring up war efforts, right? And war fervor within the United States population, uh, something that is amazing to see, right? The amount of influence that they had on the American public and their consciousness and how they viewed uh, certain foreign events. And I absolutely love this, uh, you know, imagery here. So this jester, uh, you know, seems more like a sort of devil, if you will, with the pointy uh, costumes, right, and the uh, pointed uh, cloth. And he is throwing all of these newspapers towards uh, the public. Uh, the newspaper machine is being fed by businessmen, right? Uh, these large corporate, uh, you know, entities, or even, uh, you know, over here up top, let me get the uh, clicker, the pointer. Over here up top, we have the decent citizen, the gullible reformer, businessman, right? Pretty much anyone who had money wanted to donate. He's taking all of it, printing these yellow journals, right? Yellow sensationalism and throwing it towards the masses of America. And so they are appealing to passions. They are throwing venom, attacks on honest officials, sensationalism, personal grievances, misrepresentation, self-advertisement, uh, right? All of these distorted news, probably the most important of the one bunch here. Uh, and so the American people are just eating it up. And so as you can see, the news cycles, right, and the newspaper companies had an enormous amount of influence because those at this point in time who controlled the narrative who controlled uh, the written word uh, were controlling the news and how the American public was, uh, you know, analyzing these events. Uh, and so they, they held an enormous amount of power and sway during this time. Uh, going towards Roosevelt's big stick policy, a.k.a. hard power. 
So as we are kind of looking at Roosevelt's big stick policy, uh, it is the quintessential advancement of this uh, notion of, you know, expansion, right? And expansionist ideals. And so President Theodore Roosevelt's uh, foreign expansion policy can be boiled down into his one quote here. Speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. And so this was his approach to foreign policy and diplomacy. So essentially, establish military strength, exert economic coercion, and rally political support. Uh, And so essentially, speak softly and carry a big stick means... Show the rest of the world that you got to, I mean, you know, get your head out of the gutters for any innuendos here. But show the world that you have a big stick. Essentially, you have a large military, very powerful force at your back. And that you are confident enough to use it if you need to. And so you will speak softly and tell different nations what you want and what you are going to do with the potential threat of your very powerful military and navy at your back, right? And so if you, let's say, go up to Hawaii and say, we're going to annex your territory with the entire army behind you, various things are implied there, um, and so on and so forth. And so hard power is that usage of military force uh, in politics, in diplomacy, where uh, you are willing to use your military force if necessary to accomplish your goals. And so hard power would be the traditional umbrella uh, that would go under, uh, let's say, making actual warfare, skirmishes, uh, conquering territory, etc. One of the uh, you know uh, most famous things that Theodore Roosevelt is known for, he's known for many things. He was a very, very, very active president. But uh, in conjunction with, let's say, all of this foreign policy, just like we saw with our resident naval officer and historian, uh, he ended up building the Panama Canal, finally. Uh, so he went to Panama and he helped, uh, you know, fund a revolution of the country and it ended up paying Colombia for a treaty uh, and essentially make Panama independent. Uh, and so through various means, he just like really made sure that Panama got created and they bought the strip of Isthmus territory and, you know, went in and artificially cut 82 kilometers of waterway into uh, the ground and through as much dynamite as humanly possible to move land and mountains uh, in order to make a man-made uh, river, right, or uh, this canal uh, from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And so this cut naval uh trade and military uh, movement by two-thirds because once like i said before in order for you to go to the from the west coast to the east coast by ship traditionally you had to go all around south america now you just had to go uh slightly below mexico towards panama and then you can just cut across it saved so much time and so this was seen as roosevelt really uh trying to exert as much influence as policy as, as possible because now that he had the navy at his back and at his disposal he was not afraid to use it but he obviously needed to have the possibility to use it in a quick and short manner hence the panama canal and this kind of goes alongside with his what was nicknamed the roosevelt corollary right his kind of ethos of his presidency and what he believed in And so he stated that the United States would use military force to act as an international police power and correct any wrongdoing by any Latin American nation threatening the stability of the region. So Roosevelt really started to flex his muscles as far as Central and South America goes uh, and essentially just told them, listen, we're going to be the big dogs now, right, in the region. What we say is going to go. And from this point onwards right to the modern day that trend has pretty much continued with the united states really kind of going in and trying to dictate policy and trade and anything else sadly throughout the 1900s the united states did a lot more harm than good for their latin american neighbors uh in terms of let's say cia intervention 
coup d'etats of their military um, le- and uh, political leaders uh, and kind of sowing more uh, chaos and, you know, uh, than creating stability. Uh, and so, you know, the United States in the 1900s had a wonderful opportunity to create these long lasting and beautiful kind of trade relations, right, with uh, all of our southern neighbors. However, uh, they chose to instead uh, have a more interventionist kind of conflicting, uh, you know, uh, relationship there. Ah, dollar diplomacy versus the big stick policy. So we've kind of won over the big stick policy, right? The hard power. Theodore Roosevelt going in with his gruff look and the military at his back and saying, I will do what I want and I have the military here, right? Uh, And then after Theodore Roosevelt, and you can watch these two videos back to back and kind of get a sense of what these two policies are like. They're pretty short. They're only a couple minutes long each, but they give you a nice little comparison representation of both. But after President Roosevelt, we ended up getting Taft. Uh, Well, before we get into Taft, I I should uh, say uh, a couple nice uh, primary source uh, photos of the Panama Canal being built. Uh, And like I said, this was an enormous undertaking at the time. Huge amounts of labor, dynamite, everything else being used. The French actually attempted for more than a decade to build the uh, canal. They actually attempted for a few decades and they failed. They spent thousands of lives dead, uh, millions of uh, dollars wasted because uh, this region of the world was still prone to malaria. So all of their workers were dying off from malaria. And so it was very difficult for them to make any headway. But Roosevelt came in and just pushed pushed it through, right? And he really kind of made um, his point of this is going to get done no matter what. Uh, and eventually this kind of uh, barren natural landscape gets converted into, right, this kind of industrial might uh, with various levels of the Panama Canal. Uh, and it's called... Uh, the, uh, I believe that three or four different waterways. And so what ends up happening, and you know, eventually we're gonna see this, right? The ships here. But if you can notice, let me get the pointer. Uh, the ship here is sitting on a body of water that is higher up than the, uh, the ocean, right? Over here and the river. So what would end up happening is the ships would come in from, from over here, right? They would come up uh, towards the gates they would come into this, let's say the first level, uh, and then they would raise, they would pump so much water into here. And so they would raise uh, the ships and then the ships would move. And then eventually you move on to the second level, put more water in and raise the ship and then you can go on and so forth. And so that's like a two lane highway, right? Um, that they're making here. Um, absolutely, a, you know, modern marvel if I've ever seen one. Uh, and so Theodore Roosevelt here with his big stick policy, with his Navy uh, in the Caribbean Sea and South America, right, exerting his influence um, in whatever manner he wanted. So definitely a strong, gruff president. Um, and so, so many uh, political cartoons, right, made in his image. Uh, but one of the better ones is the one here on the right hand side, because although you know, he exerted, let's say, with foreign policy, this um, this very strong and, you know, at times antagonistic, uh, you know, themes. Uh, he used it for good. So here on the right hand side, we can see he has essentially clubbed, hopefully not to death, but knocked him out. Uh, the railroad trust, the oil trust, the beer trust, etc. Right, all of these kind of corporate interests from all of our discussions of the Gilded Age, right, and all these robber barons making monstrous profits. Uh, he essentially was completely against these large corporations stealing money and wealth from the Americans, um, and so he despised corporations and trusts, and he was actively seeking to bust them up, right. Uh, and to give more financial freedom uh, and kind of, uh, you know, wealth opportunities for the middle class to grow. And so, you know, he was, you know, well-rounded for his day and age, for sure. 
And so if you want a more detailed look at the Panama Canal and kind of more diagrams of how it works and how the different tier stages and level systems work, uh, this is a nice little uh, diagram and, uh, you know, kind of discussion by BBC News of like how the Panama Canal was built, right? And it gives a lot of information on how the French tried to build it, uh, how much money and death really kind of went into building the Panama Canal, how difficult it was due to malaria. Uh, it's only, I believe, like three, four minutes long, but, you know, definitely a nice little uh, video to watch uh, to kind of get yourself up to speed. Taft's diplomacy, soft power. So we talked about Roosevelt and his uh, hard power, right? The threat of military intervention wherever uh, you see fit. And now let's talk about soft power. So President Taft, which came after Roosevelt, he had a different viewpoint of the world. So he uh, instead chose something called dollar diplomacy. And the main word there are dollars. So essentially his uh, foreign policy was going to be economic based. And so he instead favored to use the American economic power to leverage foreign countries into the policy that they would prefer. And so the main thing here was, quote unquote, he wanted to substitute dollars for bullets. And so he wanted to essentially have similar or the same or better results as Roosevelt, but through diplomacy, not military threat. Um, and so he started to pay off the debts of several Central American countries to establish very good relations um, and, you know, wanted uh, them not to be beholden to European nations, uh, but to have a very friendly relationship with the U.S. Uh, he you know, went along with uh, the Lodge Corollary, uh, you know, where... It forbade, it forbade any foreign power or interest of any kind from acquiring territory in the Western Hemisphere uh, and have any practical power of control. So he was still leveraging his, you know, position, right, as the president to tell, let's say, the rest of Europe, like, stay out of the Western Hemisphere. This is our territory now. So he was still being a strong president. But instead of threatening with military, he was doing so through an economic sphere. Um, and by the end of his presidency, the U.S. was definitely headed down the path of empire. And only a couple of years after the Lodge Corollary, World War I would unfold terribly across Europe. And America would rise to the challenge to help out their, uh, their pro proposed and supposed allies in Europe. But the one thing I want to say about dollar diplomacy uh, in relation to big stick policy throughout the 20th century and even in the 21st century where we sit here now. Uh, the Pentagon in recent years has made various studies on this, on soft and hard power. And they've actually come up with a pretty good solid research from all of these decades. And they have said that for any amount of money that they pour into uh, the military and through military intervention, uh, the diplomatic side is like 10 times at least more uh, effective and efficient. Like it's not even a comparison, they said. And so their ultimate recommendation was if the United States truly wants to retain a lot of their influence around the world, we should do so through something closer to dollar diplomacy through diplomatic means, through economic means, through relationship building, instead of military force. And it's sad to see that over all of these last decades, that the United States has instead chosen to lean closer towards uh, military uh, intervention. Uh, at times, of course, military intervention does have to be an option on the table. I'm not saying it doesn't. But We've definitely been in, you know, various engagements around the world many times over over the last, you know, few decades. And number one, it has spent an exorbitant amount of money. The United States is sitting on trillions and trillions of dollars of debt, which is affecting us and inflation and everything else. Uh, and most importantly, 
the world does not see us as this moralistic, virtuous nation going around the world trying to preach peace and world building. Uh, a lot of the world sees the United States as a uh, as a bully with a machine gun that wants to go into every nation that we find oil or resources in and take it over for quote unquote spreading freedom. And so it's interesting to note how in a matter of like a hundred years or so, the United States goes from, let's say, having the moralistic high ground and progressing and entering into all of these negotiations very cautiously uh, into now what it seems like. We, t we just turn on the news and it's like, oh, the president just uh, even this last January, the president, uh, you know, killed uh, the Iranian in January of 2020. Uh, president Donald Trump killed the uh, with a drone strike, the Iranian general randomly. OK, um, our troops are spread across the Middle East in various engagements. Right. Whenever I'm opening up the news cycle, it really just seems like we're getting into more and more chaos and trouble uh, versus, let's say, if we were just spending it through more diplomatic means and economic means, perhaps we could uh, have the similar or even better results. So just something for us to think about as we're moving forward through our lectures. Here's Mr. Taft, uh, you know, trying his best to, uh, you know, uh, have his dollar diplomacy, uh, you know, s be effective and being seen uh, just as powerful as Roosevelt. Because Roosevelt was such a larger than life character. He really was. Uh, Roosevelt was this, you know, charismatic individual. He had high amounts of energy. Uh, he was a boxer. He went hiking every chance he could. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, at one point in time, this, was, this is probably one of the most badass things you will ever hear, but uh, an assassin at one point in time when he was doing a public speech took a gun out and shot him. It hit his rib cage, so the, the wound was there and he's bleeding. What does Roosevelt do? He takes out his handkerchief, clogs, clogs the, the wound a little bit, continues and finishes his speech for another like 30 to 40 minutes before going to seeing medical attention. Like this was a really, you know, gruff, you know, hardened president that we had. And the American people were just eating it up. So Taft needed to prove something to himself and to the nation that he was as good of a leader, right? But obviously his policies were different than Roosevelt's. And so some of the political cartoons, as we see here on the right, kind of sees Uncle Sam over there kind of like, you know, snickering and kind of looking at the dynamics between uh, Taft and Roosevelt and them kind of fighting amongst each other because it's seen as, uh, at least for some of the American uh, public, you know, them being at odds with one another, right, because of their foreign policy. One was advocating more for military strength and intervention. The other one's advocating for more diplomacy and diplomatic means on that front. So, uh, you know, they did obviously have some of their differences, but obviously not to this extent. But, you know, leave it to politics and newspapers and yellow journalism, right, uh, to sensationalize some of these interactions. Um, and because of his softer view on foreign policy, Taft was kind of seen, especially in comparison to, uh, you know, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. He was seen as kind of like the softer, cuddly president, you know, um, because like, how do you follow up Theodore Roosevelt with, with this gruff kind of, you know, rough rider mantra, right? Uh, and his manifesto. So, you know, uh, here on the left hand side, it's seen as, you know, Taft being this cute, cuddly like sheep, you know with his little mustache, uh, and Theodore Roosevelt kind of, you know, kind of sheep herding, right? And uh, Theodore Roosevelt with the hook up on top says, my politics, right? So it's sort of like he's trying to, you know, drag Taft towards where he wants him to go as a president. And of course, they were in communication during Taft's presidency. He would ask Roosevelt for his opinion, right? Um, but he was definitely his own president. And so he was making his own policy decisions, of course. And so here's the end of chapter 22, folks, uh, and my meme over here on the right-hand side. I prefer the real Roosevelt, and that's FDR. I said the real Roosevelt. Uh, that's a photo of Theodore Roosevelt himself. And then we get a, 
a photograph of Robin Williams as Theodore Roosevelt in the night at the museum. Perfection. <laughs> um, and just as the ending clip, I put uh, two clips here from the night at the museum from Robin Williams' amazing portrayal of uh, Theodore Roosevelt from the night at the museum movie. Um, just as a fun little something just to round out the um, the lecture. But um, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and our kind of discussions on American uh, expansionism and isolationism, hard power, soft power, everything in between. Uh, America at this point in time is definitely growing the foundational building blocks to, as we're going to see in the next couple of lectures, uh, be able to go on to the world stage as World War One and Two are going to unleash themselves onto the world in a very brutalistic and violent manner. Uh, the U.S. is ready to step up their game and enter into that lexicon of, let's say, superpowerdom that the European nations have held on to for a long time. And so that is what awaits us in the next few lectures. Uh, and so that is the end of chapter 22. I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully it was informative and was able to consolidate some of the readings and materials into something a little more digestible. Uh, I will see you all for the next lecture. Take care.